Hello aus Tokyo. Und aus Los Angeles. Diese Woche sind ja Mattis und Sascha are both reporting the latest auto show news, but they're continents apart. Mattis is in Tokyo while Sascha is getting the lowdown in LA. Und deswegen haben wir uns aufgeteilt und sind auf beiden zu Gast. Richtig, aber sag so mal, Sascha, are we going to stick around here all day or shall we go inside? Gehen wir auch mal rein. Ich war eigentlich I'm just waiting for you, Mattis. Dann würde ich sagen, well then, let's go inside. Alles klar. The Tokyo Auto Show was something of a home match for Japanese car makers, of course. Mazda, for example, is presenting two different powertrain variations of the Mazda 3, known over here as Axela. There is the natural gas version and a hybrid. You can't tell from looking that this is a hybrid model. The only giveaway is a little badge on the rear hinting at what's under the hood. The hybrid technology is from Toyota and was adapted by Mazda's own engineers. The big German names are represented here too, of course. Taking center stage at the Porsche stand is not the accustomed sports car, but it's a new compact SUV. On the other side of the Pacific, Sasha is likewise inspecting the new Macan. It was in L.A. that it had its world premiere. The Macan is the fifth model line Porsche has launched. It's aimed at drivers looking for a sporty, compact SUV. It's standard fitted with all-wheel drive, while the new 3.6-liter V6 bi-turbo engine catapults the car from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.8 seconds. This Chevrolet Silverado is exactly the right car for American roads, Sasha reckons. Big is still beautiful here, and gas prices aren't as high as elsewhere. The Silverado has plenty of space for extra cargo. But it's not so ideal for the Japanese market, Matis points out. Over here, you need alternative mobility concepts, such as the VW Twin Up. It looks like the regular up compact car, but underneath it has the engineering of the XL1. The twin up combines a 36 kilowatt diesel engine with a 36 kilowatt electric motor. VW calls it a one liter per hundred kilometer car for the whole family. And despite the poor aerodynamics, it apparently really does guzzle only minimally more than the XL1 two-seater. In LA, VW presented the road-ready design Vision GTI. 370 kilowatts of power take the muscular hatchback from zero to 100 in just 3.9 seconds. Top speed is just beyond the 300 kilometer per hour mark. Back to Japan and the electrically powered BMW i3. It's set to hit Japanese showrooms in 2014. Matas wants to know how important electromobility is to BMW in places like Japan. The Japanese market is incredibly technology-oriented, replies the BMW R&D chief. Hybrids already account for 20-plus percent of sales here. Japanese customers are very receptive to new technologies, plus urbanization is quite advanced here. Over 70 percent of people in Japan already live in major conurbations, and this is the market that the i-brand was made for. BMW believes that it will have one of the chief sales markets in Japan. With all that famous sunshine in California, open-top driving is very popular in the Golden State. Sasha is sitting in a Z4, but BMW also has a new convertible version of the 4 Series on show. This is the second model in the relatively young 4 Series. Its steel folding roof makes it a sound option for colder regions, too. Well, the highlight is right behind me here. It's the 4 Series convertible. It's the world premiere. It's lower, it's wider, it's slightly longer. It's a great looking car. Ride quality is high thanks to the optional X-Drive all-wheel drive system and the neck warmers for front seat occupants at extra comfort at cooler times of the year. LA has also hosted a world premiere for a BMW subsidiary. Behold, the fully redesigned version of the Mini Cooper hardtop. Yeah. 
Nothing from the old Mini was retained, explains the brand's boss. He praises the work his team did on both the interior and exterior, further evolving the iconic design. Plus the technology under the hood, there you have the new three- and four-cylinder engines, 27% less fuel consumption, combined with 10% more output. The launch of this car is good news, he says. Many fans and other individualists can look forward to this latest milestone in the German-British joint venture. In Tokyo, that blue baby behind Matas is called the Toyota FCV concept. This is a hydrogen-powered car scheduled for volume production in 2015. The design appears to need some work, but the engineering is more or less complete. The only real problem facing its makers is the lack of infrastructure. Toyota's Dirk Breuer brings up the which came first scenario, the chicken or the egg. We say first you need a chicken so that somebody can carry on making the eggs, in this case filling stations. So we're encouraging an expansion of the infrastructure. We've signed commitments to fuel cell vehicles for Northern Europe, as we have done in Japan too. If I say that these vehicles are on their way, that gives builders and operators of gas stations the security they need to continue. So it's goodbye from Matas at the Tokyo Motor Show and goodbye from Sasha in L.A. They have an ocean and half the planet between them, and they both have a 12-hour flight home to Germany. So, bon voyage. Alles klar und guten Flug. We're testing the new i10 from Hyundai. Our car reviewer Ines Petri points out that the Korean car is actually European. The company's design center in Rüsselsheim has tailored it to European taste, and it is built in Turkey. Hyundai has vastly improved the i10 in its new second generation. Details normally found in higher classes have been added, like steering wheel heating, adjustable headrests for all seats, and a USB port for individual musical taste. Despite the higher value furnishings, the i10 has hardly increased in price. The head of Hyundai's public relations in Germany, Bernhard Voss, says the company is proud of the design developed by Thomas Berkler, who also created successful predecessors like the i30 and the iX35. The target group of this model is women. The car has a family face, a hexagonal grille, a beautiful profile, and it also looks like quality. This subcompact has grown a bit, which means more legroom in the back seat. At 3.67 meters, the i10 is now the longest car in the A segment of the European Union standard classification. And no, that hasn't reduced the car's turning radius, which is still 9.5 meters, even though the i10 is 13 centimeters longer than competitors like the VW Up. The new i10 comes only as a five-door. Foss says Hyundai offers two different engines for the i10. One is completely new for the company, a three-cylinder. The interior has been specially insulated to reduce the noise associated with this engine type. And that's a special selling point. Inside, it's up to six decibels quieter than competing cars. And that's quite a lot. We took a closer look at the new three-cylinder engine. And we're surprised at how smooth and powerful it is on the road. Once it gets up to 155 kilometers per hour, there isn't much more acceleration. But the little vehicle is supposed to average only 4.7 liters of super gasoline per 100 kilometers. Ina says the steering is quite easy and the car takes curves perfectly. She imagines city driving will be a lot of fun with the i10.
Now let's take a look at the trunk. Its load volume ranges from 252 to just over 1,000 liters, enough for a small suitcase. The interior of the I-10 is roomier than its competitors. Not even adults are squeezed in the back seat. The Hyundai i10's bigger exterior is reflected inside. Here the driver's seat is adjusted optimally, and Enos still has enough room in the back to move her legs. The back seat is pleasant to sit in. The workmanship in the interior is top-notch, but we wondered why Hyundai is growing more and more European. Hyundai's Bernhard Voss points out that while other companies may have a 100-year tradition, Hyundai has only been around for 40 years. It's flexible enough to concentrate on the markets where it has success, and that means Europe, especially Germany. The PR man says Hyundai has set up a special testing center at the Nürburgring racetrack, where it tests vehicles in continuous operation. This allows them to adjust the steering, braking and driving dynamics to do better in competition in Europe. So what's our car testers' overall judgment of the I-10? Ina says the I-10 has turned out really well and is an outstanding city car. The I-10 will also market a dual-fuel gasoline liquefied petroleum gas variant. Audi welcomes a new addition to its A3 family. The A3 convertible comes with the notchback look of the sedan and weighs 50 kilograms less than its predecessor, despite being 18 centimeters longer. It will hit the market in spring 2014 with three engine choices, two gasoline and one diesel ranging between 103 and 132 kilowatts of power. Prices in Germany start at 31,700 euros. Skoda's first Yeti generation has received a facelift. For the first time, the compact SUV comes in two versions, the elegantly styled Skoda Yeti for city driving and the Yeti Outdoor for more adventurous terrain. The difference is only visual though. Technically, the two versions are the same. The new Yeti is also the first vehicle from Skoda to come equipped with a rear view camera. Happy birthday BMW motorbikes. The Munich-based giant hosted a special anniversary event at its headquarters, with plenty on show for guests. It wasn't always an easy ride, however. The two-wheeler division had some serious obstacles to overcome in the 1970s. It was a time when the market was dominated by the Japanese, recalls BMW bikes executive Carl Gerlinger. They introduced practically every conceivable model and engine configuration and segment. And there we were with a two-cylinder boxer concept, a monoculture that could no longer survive on its own. That wasn't enough for a market we used to be a leader in. We had fallen behind where the Japanese were way ahead. The highlight of the evening, a motorbike incorporating icons of the past and future developments. The R9T, whose name is no coincidence, of course. The Neo Retro Bike has plenty of thrills without the frills and comes with an array of customization options. The R9T is a concentration of 90 years of BMW heritage, explains BMW Motorbikes President Stefan Schaller. It focuses on the purer side of motorbike design, the minimum needed. BMW's latest machine is also a throwback to the past. The R90S, for example, was the first BMW bike to have a designer involved, an important milestone for BMW. It hit the headlines again when the racing version took Steve McLaughlin to victory in the very first Superbike event in 1976. Yeah, 
This bike had a lot to do with my life, but besides winning the first superbike race, uh, it was kind of the last of the old generation of bikes. And then they became more technical after this. And there was a period after this period in the late 70s when the European bikes fell away and the Japanese took over everything. And then somewhere in the 80s, by the time 88, by the time of World Superbike, then the European bikes used to come, came back. But these are, this is what we like to call the old school bike. When you rode it, it moved a little, it was not so stable, you know, it was like a living being thing, you know. Harley Davidsons are still like this, but uh, the new modern bikes are much more stable, much more tractable, and much safer, for sure. BMW continues to move with the times. Another example being the C Evolution electric scooter, a pioneering piece of engineering. And far from being consigned to history, the GS is one of the old school models being further evolved to keep up with the competition. It now has a highly effective combined air and water cooling system. The classic form with the beak remains. His motorbike division doesn't play the essential role for the group in business terms, but Stefan Schaller does see it playing an emotional role. For many people, BMW bikes provides an emotional anchor. When it comes to BMW, they say, wow, they compete in races, they race through the countryside, they have GSs. It's a special kind of motivation. And the 9T is not short on emotional appeal either. Unlike the GS with its practical virtues, this model is all about sheer enjoyment. The engine is a big part of the fun factor. The air-cooled 1.2-liter two-cylinder boxer engine generates 81 kilowatts and 120 newton meters of torque. Prices for the 9T in Germany start at 14,500 euros. The Studebaker Avanti was a chapter of automotive history all to itself. In 1963, Porsche had brought out its first 911, Lamborghini was developing its 350 GT, and Chevrolet had premiered its Corvette Stingray. The United States was turning out cars as never before, with Chevrolet making some 10,000 a day. The long-standing but now struggling Studebaker Corporation threw its new sports coupe into the fray, the Avanti. Studebaker had signed on a big name in the automotive design world. French-American industrial designer Raymond Lowy had designed the Coca-Cola bottle, the Shell logo, and the Lucky Strike cigarette package. Now he was Studebaker's last hope and tasked with making the Avanti a success. It was radically different and needed forward-looking with an innovative chassis and powerful drivetrain. It was avant-garde on wheels. Uli Velauer, president of the Swiss Studebaker Club, is a great admirer of pioneer designer Raymond Loewy and his classic creations. Loewy was aiming for a lightweight, streamlined car with low fuel consumption. His motto was, ugliness doesn't sell. In the Avanti's case, beauty is truly in the eye of the beholder. The contours were unaccustomed, especially for the time. But a closer look and a good eye for detail reveals the real beauty of the Avanti's revolutionary form. Single seats, circular dials, a stick shift, and simple interior were unusual in American cars at the time. It was more the look and feel of a French or Italian luxury car. The light and spacious interior seats four adults comfortably, another unusual aspect for a 1960s coupe. The Avanti safety features included an integrated roll bar. The body was made of polyester, a cutting-edge material that, in 1963, was still causing some problems in production. 
The polyester back then was not very good quality, explains Uli Velauer. It caused the paint to crack, which demanded more intensive maintenance. The engine is phenomenally powerful, but even with its disc brakes and fine aerodynamics around fast curves, the Avanti shows its age and origins. On straight sections, with a top speed of 190 kilometers per hour, it more than lives up to its name. It set all manner of land speed records for factory stock cars back in the day. The Avanti's engine is a 4.7 liter 240 horsepower V8. The optional supercharger added nearly 100 horsepower more. In 1964, after turning out just 4,600 vehicles, production was stopped. Two years later, Studebaker was bust. But the Avanti outlived its maker. Two former dealers bought the Avanti name, production facilities, and tooling, and hand-built replicas with Chevrolet technology through the 1990s, a tribute to Raymond Lowy's timeless design.